right, we are at 5.30. And Annie, do we have everyone we need for our first item, the supporting remote learners? Yes, I believe so. Uh, Jen or Michelle, if Becky is here on a computer. She, she is, name. she's as Mr. Driver. Ah, uh, there you go, okay. <laughs> oh, I can't find her, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, here we go. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone to the February 1st, my word, it's February already. Uh, February 1st, 2021 Hadley School Committee Public School Meeting. Is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any adjustments to the agenda for tonight? Uh, no, I do not believe, although I'm not sure if I have on the agenda updates. Did I neglect to put that on there? But there will be a chance. Uh, we'll add announcements and updates after the school committee, or sorry, act, after action items before next meeting dates. And I think we also wanted to discuss um, the resolution for COVID-19 uh, vaccinations and educators being prioritized. Uh, we brought that up at a prior meeting. So if we could add that as a presentation and discussion item as well. Yes. And that can go with maybe metrics and testing. Sure thing. All right, any other adjustments? No, I don't believe so. Great, okay. Let's open up with public comment then. Um, for folks who are new to the process, uh, please, you have a digital hand. Usually it's at the bottom of your screen or in your participants panel. And if you would raise that, then we can just call on you. I see there is one now and we will adhere to public comment policy, allowing for three minutes for um, each comment. And just as a reminder for folks, uh, it's an opportunity for us to hear from you about um, items that we will be discussing, but typically public comment is not a Q and A or a, a discussion in itself. It is again, as stated, an opportunity for us to hear from you, your comments on uh, whatever item you wish to raise. Um, all right, I will call first on Tony Fiden and I will ask you to unmute. Hi there, everyone. Thanks for uh, hosting the meeting tonight. And uh, uh, I wanted to speak on a, an issue that was brought up at, a, um, I think it was on the 24th of January by Ms. Dowd when she was discussing the had the elementary school curriculum. And this was um, something that I was not familiar with, which is the uh, cultural um, cultural scorecard, culturally responsive curriculum scorecard. And that was, um, is, um, I'm, I'm sure it's something that you have discussed and I don't, I don't get to see uh, all of the meetings. So it was new to me. So I did, did some research on it and I want to um, just put some points out there for your consideration. It was, um, as I said, I was not familiar with it, and I, I did go to the website and look into this and um, tried to go in with an open mind. And uh, but I did have some um, some concerns with the way that it with the with the with the scorecard itself. First of all, I think that it's important that we stick with when we're dealing with tools like this. That I think we um, we stick with evidence based um, tools. And this one is is not in my mind. It's a, it's a new it's a new scorecard. That was developed in 2019 for New York, New York City, and uh, for their specific uh, for their specific needs, their school system, and it was developed for English language arts and uh, and it's 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 being instituted in New York right now, and the the actual data on how it will perform is very limited, and and really it's it's not only limited for New York City, but it's not at all clear how that would apply to different districts and in this case different uh, different subjects uh, when we're dealing with social studies that Ms. Dowd was talking about. So um, I think it's when, when, when something that's going to have an impact on our curriculum on our school system I think it's uh, I don't know if we should just jump into a new tool that hasn't been really tested to see what what the consequences of it might be. Secondly and I'm, I know my time's limited so I'm uh, speaking quickly. Secondly the uh, I have some issues with just the just the structure of the scorecard itself. The um, I found it 
I just found it very troubling. The, the process of going through books and authors and scoring them based on um, their race, their perceived race, their perceived uh, background, their ethnicity, um, even their sexuality, it's, it seems to me to be completely subjective. And, and, and for, for people to be going through a book or curriculum materials and trying to make judgments based on that, based on what, what people look like, I think it's just, I, I don't think it's something that we should be doing. You wouldn't want anyone to be, be basically looking around a room and saying, oh, this is, I'm putting that person in a category based on what they look like or based um, on anything, anything subjective like that. So I think it's, there are some, that, that I found that kind of troubling. It's a, uh, and this is a, as you look at the scorecard, it's, it's pretty serious. They go from anywhere from um, supporting uh, diverse uh, curriculum to culturally destructive. And that is based on, on in many cases, on, on race and, and uh, perceived ethnicity, perceived, even perceived uh, sex, uh, sexuality, which is, I don't know how, how that would, how that would all, all shake down. As I said, it's just something completely new. And it's, um, as I was going through this, I said, I was thinking, it's just, um, to me, it seems like the wrong approach altogether to be actually counting and checking boxes with, based on pictures and, and images and some of the, the stories. And, um, you know, I have uh, two, two girls in the school system, they're at Hopkins now, and we tried to, we've always tried to teach them that when you, when you meet someone, when you see someone, whether it's in the news or on TV, you don't make judgments. You don't don't assume that you know anything about them based on what they look like or what they're uh, what they're wearing, and certainly not not their skin color. And so this approach seems to be the complete opposite of what we've been trying to teach our girls. It's it's um, making those kind of judgments. And in this case, there are consequences to those judgments because. You're gonna you're you're going to be either buying materials or not buying materials, going taking your curriculum in one direction or another, based on that. Especially, and one of the one of the most uh, one of the priorities of this is with authors, and trying to get authors um, authors of color, which is is a worthy goal. But when you're when you're talking about buying materials, um, just I, I was thinking, what if I walked into Barnes and Noble and said I like this book, but I want to know the the race of the author. That would be kind of absurd to me, uh, and and in this case, we're actually doing that. We're saying we're trying to make judgments on on our purchases based on race, without looking into, without knowing any of their experience, their their uh, their achievements, and and it ju it just seems really the wrong approach um, to go. And it just uh, and and. It, it seems it, it's wrong and it's it's just saying it's in the name of diversity and inclusion is not going to is not going to make it right and and the consequences of it I, as i said were are, are serious if, if i i was an english major in college and i can look back um and i'm a writer now and i can look back on the on the the text and the authors that i studied in in college and and say would how many of these would have been eliminated and based on based on this kind of a scorecard, and you know maybe some of that would have been an improvement, but maybe not. Are we gonna are we gonna not read Hemingway? Are we not read Flannery O'Connor? Or um, you know you you could go right down the list that, that people who their their text probably had may not have scored highly in their and their own personal background they had issues with. So uh, you could end up losing a lot and just a final point when you're talking about these authors who who may have had problems but when i was in college a long time ago but they, you know we were expected to think critically and to read critically and to look at these things these issues there are the the biases of the authors and it was not we were not just going in and not expected to you know taking everything at, at face value and our, our 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 teachers were expected to foster those conversations and, um, and, and talk about what, what those issues might be. And, and um, I know my time is limited, so I'll, I'll end there, but I, I really was, 
I, I really find it very problematic for, for those issues that it's not, there's not enough evidence that this will work or what it will look like, that it's, it's wrong to, to make these kind of judgments that may be very subjective. And it's just a, a, a wrong approach that may actually end up hurting, or, you know, being counterproductive to our goals when you're talking about um, being very identity based and making judgments based on group identities or, or race. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you bringing your concerns to our attention. And I think, um, you know, being able to respond to that in the future in terms of when we discuss more in the future about very specific initiatives, uh, being able to fold your comments into that conversation about um, the scorecard uh, tool itself um, and some of the points that you raised, I do really appreciate you raising those um, in, a, in, in a very clear fashion. Uh, I understood what you're asking us to look into and um, look towards uh, a future discussion around that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do see one more um, public comment at this time, and that is uh, Sarah um, Pegas. I hope I said that right. I'm going to ask you to unmute. My apologies if I mispronounce your name, Sarah. Hello, it's Sarah Pegas, but totally fine. No one gets Thank it. Thank you. <laughs> so I wanted, I believe I saw metrics on the agenda for tonight. And I just wanted to um, say a few things. I was at the meeting Wednesday or the discussion, sorry, Wednesday that Paul led. And um, one of the things that really stood out for me is the trust that the staff has in their safety of their work environment. And from being at the, I've been to many um, virtually school committee meetings and it really, the message I got was teachers were just ready to get back to the classroom and not much more information. From hearing all but one of the teachers that spoke, they all had concerns about what they see, what they need, and how it all weighs on them. And I really hope that their concerns are addressed before you talk about changing the metrics or opening more. I mean, my heart went out to them. And if I had not already decided to keep my son at home, that would have solidified my decision listening to the teacher. So I just wanted to say that. Um, again, my heart goes out to, to everyone, but especially people that are in a public work environment. So I just wanted to say that and um, wish them well. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for your comments. And um, we will be talking about the metrics tonight um, and really the outcomes of uh, what I think was a, a very open and productive conversation um, with the Hadley Education Association. So the, the uh, educators that are on the ground in administration. Uh, and so we look forward to talking through that tonight and the um, mutual agreement that we've come to um, and where our priorities are looking ahead. All right, um, any other public comment? If so, please raise your digital hand. Okay, seeing none, we will move forward with the next topic, uh, first presentation and discussion item. So our first item is around supporting remote learners uh, at Hadley Elementary School. Uh, and we have three presenters for that. I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Wittowitz, are you leading this? I'm, I'm gonna start us off. Thanks. Um, we, we, we just wanted to speak to um, some work we've been doing trying to kind of uh, get some more out to remote learners. Um, during school committee meetings, families and school committee members expressed a desire to ensure equity for remote students and teachers at the elementary school expressed the same desire um, given that they had in-person students. And again, let me just preface this by saying I'm, I'm speaking to when in-person students are also uh, present. Um, Given that they had in-person students between the hours of 8.30 and 1, teachers found it logistically difficult to provide instruction for both groups. They felt as though they needed more support in order to offer additional opportunities to remote learners. The school committee expressed their willingness to help be a part of the solution. Um, 
So Mrs. Witowitz and I reached out to colleagues and asked for volunteers to join a committee to explore ideas for providing additional support to remote learners. Um, we discussed a number of possible and creative ideas and decided to put out a survey to teachers about what was needed at each grade level. Um, and we're gonna just kind of go over the result, results of that survey. So that committee surveyed all classroom teachers um, as well as our special education teachers and our Title I and ELL teachers. We had 12 respondents to that survey. Out of the 12, approximately 75% indicated that um, they could use additional support for their remote learners during the time block of 8.30 to 1. So that's the time that they currently have um, for in-person learners as well. So they indicated um, support could be used for remote learners during 8.30 to one. And we broke that down the 8.30 to one time block to half hour chunks. And there's a lot of overlap there, anywhere between three, um, as few as three to as many as 10 teachers um, indicated that during a variety of half hour chunks that they could use additional support for remote learners. The second question we asked was um, about that afternoon piece. The, the, uh, between the hours of one and three, we asked teachers what kinds of supports they'd be looking for um, during that period of time. So um, one respondent indicated that they would need assistance between one and 1.30, five between 1.30 and two, five between two and 2.30, and three respondents between 2.30 and three. And about 50% of people um, said they would need additional help in the afternoons. Uh, and the last thing that we asked of teachers was to um, provide us with ideas for what they were looking for to support those remote learners. And um, there was a range. It ranged from opportunities for socialization to be meeting with peers and chatting, um, having some social opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise, um, as well as social emotional lessons. Um, in school, we offer things like whole body listening, sex and step in zones of regulation. So we would like to be able to provide that particular in the lower grades to some of our learners. And um, academic support was needed as well. Um, some, we are finding some remote students having difficulty completing assignments um, or just being offered intervention or support for any, any ELA or math, math assignments. So we then um, presented our findings or are um, looped missed out in on the, the findings and the survey results. Great, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because we did some nice work around looking at schedules and the resources currently in the building. Um, let me go ahead and pull that up. You missed out, I think your camera's off. Oh, my camera's off. Oh, okay. I'm not sure why my camera is off. I can see myself. There you are. There you are. Oh, good. Oof. Okay. Um, I'm very nervous about getting hacked still. So <laughs> I want to make sure that does not happen. Um, I apologize. Trying to get my screen up. Hmm. Uh, here we go. Schedules. Can everybody see my schedule now? No, it's not sharing your screen yet. Hmm. Okay. What about now? Here we go. There we go. Yay. Okay, great. It was up on my screen. I don't know what's happening over here. Um, but all right. So what we started with, um, it was wonderful to work in collaboration with Ms. Witowitz and Ms. Jelinas and actually the entire staff. What I initially did was ask everybody to work with me around being very specific in their particular schedules, how many remote students, which now has shifted um, since we initially started this project. Um, we've actually added more in-person students um, from two weeks prior to. 
um, putting this information together. So we've, we've been working on it um, over the weekend to make sure we have accurate numbers. But if you look at the first column, this shows the schedules of staff to support the remote, the remote learners in minutes per week. So Monday through Friday. As you can see, we have a range when we examined everybody's schedule and looked at direct student minutes for remote learners. Um, you can see that remote learners receive approximately between 150 and 300 minutes um, with their classroom teacher. Now this is the direct um, relation of direct instruction from their classroom teachers. And you can see the breakdown kindergarten through grade six. Um, the second column here is this highlights when students are both in person and remote getting live instruction from their teacher. Um, this is much more successful at the upper grades where students are more independent with being able to log on, log off, navigate their screens independently. So this speaks to the remote learners that are able to log on and see what's happening live in their classrooms. Um, things that have been very helpful in this have been document cams. We just purchased um, seven additional document cams, which we're hoping we'll be able to facilitate more opportunities opportunities for this kind of live instruction for students. So you can see the minutes that are happening between um, for our, our in-person and remote and also um, so our in-person and remote. That's from grades three to grade six. The next column is the number of remote learners. This again has changed in the past two weeks. Um, recently, we just got 100% of fourth graders back for in-person instruction. This will help um, navigate some and, and talk to um, additional staff for support. Since there are no more uh, remote learners in grade four, how can we look at our current resources um, that were, were previously spent for our fourth grade students um, since now we are at 100% in person? Oops, sorry. The next is um, our grade level support staff. So this speaks just to the grade level support per, um, per classroom, not per classroom, per grade level. Um, you'll see in kindergarten, we have two ESPs. In grade one, we have Ms., uh, Mr. Catania. He's our PE teacher. Obviously, um, specials are remote this year. So we took the um, specials teachers and allocated them to grade levels for support. And so Coach Catania from 825 to 11 is in grade one. And then there is an additional ESP that works between the, the first grade classrooms. Um, each classroom does have one assigned ESP. This originally was really to focus on in-person uh, overflow spaces. We currently are not using any overflow spaces. So those, those um, staff members are um, in classrooms to help with the um, remote learners, to help with supervision, to help the teachers alleviate some um, time in the classroom so that they can go and address the needs of the remote learners. Um, in grade five, we have Ms. Brain. Um, so she's been allocated to that grade level, same schedule as Mr. Catania from 825 to 11. And then in grade six, they have one ESP. Um, if you look at the Title I support, this is identified for students at each grade level that are supported remotely. So there are students that are ident identified as needing Title I reading support. They work with Rebecca DeBartolomeo. And these are the minutes that are allocated per grade level in which she works with those students. You'll notice there's two zeros there. Um, that just simply means that there are no students in that grade level that require um, remote Title I support services. And then our math support, that's um, Mr. Richards, and he's dual certified in art and math. And so he early on had a schedule where he was supporting students that were struggling. And you can see that his minutes are very devoted to um, our remote learners. He also makes videos and puts things together for math instruction for teachers. Just for our reference for the last page, um, I wanted you to be able to see how many in-person students we have. So again, in fourth grade, we have 32. Those are all of our currently fourth grade enrolled students. Um, our numbers are, 
are obviously a lot higher. We've we've said that from the beginner, beginning that we've had a lot more um, in-person students. Our final numbers are 205 in-person students. And now we're down to 50, uh, 45. That was from 57 a week ago. I've also spoken to some families that kind of wanted to see how this week was going to roll out um, and are looking to add their children in, in person. Um, I did want to also highlight that this is not 100% of the staff. We do have remote support for students with IEP accommodations that's coordinated through Pam Haywood, Director of Student Services. Um, this includes things like academic support, OT, PT, psychological speech services that are in accordance with the student's specific plans. That information is not in this current document, um, but there are students, there are students that receive um, specialized instruction in person and remote. Um, we also have one-to-one -one ESPs and those students, those um, ESPs are not responsible for remote students considering they work with students in the building um, and their, their assignments are working one-on-one -on -one to support students. Some of the recommendations um, that I'm going to be making is to meet with preschool. That's a resource that we have recognized that perhaps can help um, teachers. Um, our preschool is, is small but mighty and our uh, support staff in preschool is willing to um, help out and work with classroom teachers around um, getting materials together, supporting teachers in their planning time and basically doing anything. Um, they're just a great group of people that have expressed that they will be um, working with us to facilitate supports for classroom teachers. I'm also going to be looking at grade four considering we now have 100% of students um, at that grade level, I'm working with Pam Haywood to create schedule um, for the new ESP. We did hire a new, a new ESP. She started this week. Um, and so she will be allocated to supporting some special education students, but also in grade three, we had an unexpected retirement that happened uh, this year. And so we're, we're working um, to try to support that grade level. I'm also going to continue to adjust the schedule and after all new schedule changes um, that are created, I'm going to share with the staff and make a determination if we need additional staff and post accordingly to need. And that's, my, that's uh, what I have so far. I'm open for questions or you can ask um, Ms. Jelena's questions or uh, Michelle Watowitz. I'm very grateful for HEA to be working with us to identify needs um, at the building and really support our teachers. Uh, thank you all for the information gathering and, and presentation. I did have one question and um, it, actually two, sorry. First one, <laughs> looking at the survey results between um, the preferred time for additional support between 8.30 and one where you broke it out by time block, um, 10 people selected the nine to 9.30 block, which was the one that kind of everybody I centered around that. Um, I was curious if you had any takeaways around what's happening right at that time, if it's just getting started, if it's getting, um, you know, underway on, on the work for the day, what, if there's any commonality about what's happening during that time block that your takeaway in terms of what kind of support might be cross grade helpful. So typically in when it's in person, um, teachers start a morning meeting anywhere between 8.30 and 9 with the safety and health procedures in place this year that's bumped back a little bit. So I think that that's why that's such a popular time block is 9 to 9.30 because um, really you're setting up the child, you're setting up any student's day for success by meeting with them early, setting the day's expectations, um, making their routines um, and, and getting ready. And that's something that's been a great challenge when we're juggling both in-person and remote learners that um, we don't get, the, the general feeling is that we aren't always able to get to the remote learners as early in the day as we would like to. Got it, that, that helps me to understand kind of what's going on during that time frame and juggling between folks that are in the classroom versus the remote learners that are not physically sitting there. Um, thank you. And then my follow up. So I, and I guess I could add, sorry to, to add ahead. to, and now um, she talked about three through six doing um, 
both simultaneously, but particularly in the lower grades, uh, it's easier for us to um, sort of settle in the in-person students first prior to stepping away to work with the remote students. So hopefully that answered your question. But yeah, we're I think we're really looking um, to, to get to the remote students earlier and set up their day as successfully as possible for them. Got it. And yeah, I think um, I was approaching it more of a, if there's a shared approach, uh, you know, if there's a common bottleneck area that you see as this is the time frame that we just want to solve, um, whether that's, you know, somebody who's dedicated to the, I'm going to help offset that time frame by, you know, but it sounds like it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, work at that time in terms of getting people started, getting kids started. Uh, and we're, you know, I look forward to hearing the ideas and, and additional, um, you know, creative solutions that come out of the work that you and the committee are doing. And I think my follow-up question was really, is there anything at this, at this point in the process that you've identified where we can be of help, we being the school committee members in front of you, uh, that we can help with in supporting? And you can hold on that if you'd like until I know others have some questions and comments, but... I'd love to hear if there are specific needs that we can help investigate or support in any way. I, I just wanna build on what Heather uh, commented. She said, it sounds like it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one setting up each individual child for success, but I, I actually wonder if it's the, the teacher and their four remote learners or the teacher and their however many remote learners as a group to say, this is what I'm asking you to do for the day. Um, do you, can I answer any questions? You're building on this work. Oh, you already did it, no problem. But it's a, a group thing, not necessarily one-on-one -on -one triaging. Is that, do I, am I, do I have it wrong, Michelle? Or is that true, that it's small group? I think it's um, more grade. I, I would say more grade level. Um, I think for a classroom teacher, ideally a classroom teacher would like to be able to check in and meet with their remote learners, which would be a small group right now, most grades, if you're looking at it um, and, and get their day started. Mm -hmm. Right. And I found that too, Humera, that it's really grade specific. Um, and so it's, it's unique to the grade level. It's unique to the remote learners um, need of support. And so, you know, each child is very different. In, in the way that they learn, the way that they need support. And so that's one of the challenging things for our staff because we're, we are so committed to making sure that every student's set up for success. And that often happens, especially at the younger grades in the morning, the kids are ready to go. And so it's, it's just, it's wanting to make sure that we do justice and meet the needs of all of our learners at the optimal times. Um, you know, a, a five-year-old looks very different at, you know, 250 than, you know, at 950. So that's why we just, um, just to answer your question. I'll say I look very different at 250 versus 950 <laughs> after being on Zoom all day. Um, we all do. We all, we all do. do. Yes, yeah, that's thanks. true. That's yeah. true. Good point, Paul. Be worse than most. But uh, so the, I guess the question is, um, you did this great analysis and thank you for that based on sort of a zero sum game, meaning you've got what you have. And, and, but, you know, getting back to Heather's point, and this is a question, I guess, for Annie too, you know, with some of the federal funding that's coming our way, does that provide us more options if Jen and her folks come back and say, you know, we really can't meet the need that's been expressed just with the resources we have, we need additional resources. Are those an option? Yes. So just to underscore the primary purpose and thank you very, very much, uh, Ms. Dowd, Ms. Lutowitz, and Ms. Jolinas. I know how much uh, work went into just getting into the details and thinking through what people need, how we're currently allocating resources, and how we might allocate resources differently, maybe, and or increase the amount of resources we have. So the purpose of this, and this will make a lot of sense when we get to the end on a um, budget update uh, recommendation that I have, is just um, that these folks have done a great job of demonstrating due diligence, which is a very important priority in the town. Um, so absolutely, if the recommendation is that um, we need additional staff or 
whatever it is, additional or different technology. We do have um, federal funds that can help with that. We do have school choice funds that can help with that. Uh, we just want to demonstrate to the town at all times that we think deeply and critically before we uh, make a recommendation or act. And thank you all. You did a phenomenal job with that. I appreciate it. And Jen, you can stop sharing your screen if you like. Okay. Yeah, I just want to build on what Annie just said. I, I really appreciate the fact that you took to heart our urging to be creative. And uh, this clearly demonstrate to me the, the, um, that you did that. And um, I can see some um, out of the box solutions potentially being applied. Um, so I look forward to um, seeing that come to life. Thank you. And just so that you are aware in any remote families that are on this call, um, I will be hosting a um, remote family Zoom session for next week because I wanna hear also not just from our staff of what we need, but from the families directly. And so um, I will be putting together a survey for them, but I always, I, I just, I think I get a lot more from a conversation. And so I would like to meet with those remote families, invite them in to speak with me, to share their concerns, their feedback, um, and then share that information with the staff as well. So I'll be scheduling that for next week. And Jen, you, you had the numbers of, of the students that are mm -hmm. gonna be in. We haven't been in, in person since before Christmas. So is this done via a survey? Yeah, we put a survey together. We surveyed the staff, um, not the staff, I'm sorry. We remote. We surveyed the remote families last Wednesday. Okay. Um, and then we found out Thursday that we were coming back in person. So we everybody responded, which was wonderful. Gotcha. And I did have some people responding that they would like to hold off until this week was, was passed. And so um, those numbers will continue to shift. Um, We'll continue, that graph also shows 100% of staff in. One of the challenges that I am faced with is, is when people get sick, when we need support in different grade levels, um, it's one of the years that we just have to be flexible and almost work week to week to make sure that we have everything up and running. Um, but I do anticipate that those numbers will shift. But yes, it's, it's current information. Um, up until this morning, we were working on it just... Um, and, and I can't thank my administrative staff enough because they have made phone calls to get accurate numbers to make sure that when teachers come back, they know exactly who's gonna be in front of them and ready to go. I just wanna say thank you real quick um, to Michelle and Becky and Jen for coordinating all this, but really when I look at, um, when I look at the schedule and availability and what runs through my head is just um, appreciation for all staff at, AG, uh, at AGS. And I, I, I know I can extend that to the high school as well because I feel like all of you have really rolled up your sleeves and said, what can we do? How can we help? How can we make the schedule better? You're all working just amazingly together and really just focusing on how can we make um, the days of the students, both remote and um, in person, when they're in person, better. And I just, I appreciate that. And I appreciate your um, dedication and your professionalism um, to these kids and to the school as a whole. So just thank you again. And I don't think we can say our appreciation enough right now in this time because it's tiring and it's trying and you all are still coming on this Zoom with a smile. So thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate that. We appreciate your support um, and we look forward to the possibility of giving more to those remote learners during that time. Great. Thanks so much. And we look forward to, you know, hearing more on this and hearing about um, what else, what other creative solutions or what needs uh, may arise. Anything else on this topic? All right, well, thank you all, appreciate it very much. Um, and I'm sure we will be hearing more about it in the future, so thank you. Next, uh, we have the review of public health data. I am going to share my screen, although Heather, I'm going to ask that I can just make this one announcement out of order because it is really stressing me out, simply because I will not get the school brains notification until later. 
So we, the district will um, be closed entirely tomorrow. That is going to be weather that's weather related, and I can go through all the reasons to justify that. Um, but some people will be frustrated, and some people won't. Just know there will be no remote instruction. There will be no in-person instruction tomorrow. And I will be sending out something on school brains and I will send out a phone call assuming school committee ends at a reasonable hour. Uh, and that will come out tonight, but I just wanted people to hear that. I certainly wanted the staff on uh, this, at this meeting to hear that as well. If you have uh, other questions about the building or building access, you can email your building principal. Okay, so now I'm gonna share my screen on the health data. And uh, these are our data from most recently, uh, last Wednesday. So we can see that the average daily incidence rate did go down in Hampshire County, that's column D, and testing positivity fell below 3%, which is why this week would be an in-person week. Although judging from my weather calls, you're probably all of you are saying, well, you didn't do a great job of that, but I did not call for it the storm, I can assure you. Uh, I just thank you, uh, HES, for giving me these data. I just updated the HES in person and remote, and I will do the same for Hopkins Academy when I've spoken with their front office. Um, and uh, sadly and unfortunately, I did notify families today that we've had another staff member um, test positive for COVID-19. We notified the close contacts. We didn't have any student close contacts because students have been remote. We do uh, hope that the staff member certainly does not get seriously ill, feels better quickly. Uh, we're thinking of the staff member and um, again, wish them the best. Uh, and um, yeah, that's all of our data from last week. I don't know if the school committee has any questions or just wanted to have any discussion about that. And I can also, well, actually, perhaps if you don't mind, I will, uh, hold on. I will, sorry, I wanna put up a different screen. Um, Hey, while we're pulling that up, Annie, I just want to make a note that um, based on our last conversation, one thing that really stuck out to me is that these are these numbers are for, from those who report that their children have COVID. Um, and so we don't always know. There, there's nothing that legally requires anyone to report. We, it, it is the ethical thing to do. We implore people to, and we strongly urge the community to report um, when there are known instances of COVID, but um, this is a minimum number. In fact, a, an, an article that I read that included Fauci's comments about the current numbers, he said, okay, well, we know it's this. I think it was in his recent New York Times interview. So we can tr truly expect that it's four times that which was startling to me nationally, nationally. And I'm not saying that it's four times this in Hadley, but I just wanna make sure people realize this is what is reported. I'm really grateful that you said that Humera. I always like to remind families, please, even when children are remote, even if you're planning to keep your child remote all year, it's very helpful to us um, when we know when there are cases involving anyone in our school community, any learner or any faculty or staff member. And also um, sometimes particularly, this is certainly more true at Hopkins Academy. Uh, it could be that a student came in for materials pickup. Just is really beneficial and helpful to us to know exactly who is tested positive so we can make sure that we have done thorough contact tracing. Um, the other document that's related to the data that we looked at is part of the summary from the conversation that Heather, you reference between the HDA and the school committee. This is uh, what went out to the staff, but I thought it might be helpful to just read to the community as well. Um, so the school committee and representatives from labor met to review our district metrics for in-person learning in light of updated recommendations from public health experts. The path to zero 
uh, faculty and staff feedback, community feedback, and emerging information on new strains of the COVID-19 virus. Labor and management agreed that the district should continue to follow its existing metrics for in-person learning. Those existing metrics are no evidence of school transmission, the testing positivity in Hampshire County would need to be below 3% or the average daily incidence rate in Hampshire County below 25 per 100,000. Labor and management discussed how the district might implement a surveillance testing program that would enhance our infection control strategies. Representatives from the school committee will work with the superintendent and seek input from faculty, staff, and families to develop a surveillance testing plan for the district. Some people have asked me surveillance testing. I had one great email from somebody who said, hey, I was raised in the 60s. That sounds a little frightening. It just means um, testing asymptomatic individuals to see if anybody is positive. Uh, also, let me move this over so I can scroll down. Labor and management, and this part is perhaps the most important part for me, labor, labor and management underscore the values that have and will continue to inform our decision-making. All stakeholder groups, faculty, staff, parents, students, administration, and school committee have a shared goal. And that is to increase in-person learning opportunities in a way that is responsible, reasonable, prioritizes health and safety, and that is informed by science and data. Please know that remote learning will always remain an option this year, but this is about increasing in-person learning opportunities for those families who would prefer those opportunities. None of these groups are adversaries. We are not adversaries. We must remember that we are not fighting each other. Achieving our goal requires critical thinking and complex problem solving, deep listening, and the ability to understand perspectives that differ from ours and compassion. We are all committed to regularly reviewing our plans and practices to ensure that we are integrating recommendations and feedback, that we're balancing the needs of multiple stakeholders, and that we are doing all we can to support and respect each other as we continue to navigate a challenging, overwhelming, and often frustrating time. We are all trying our best to balance our individual and collective needs and to do our part to get through this experience, and we will. So simply for weather reasons, a bunch of children who were probably thrilled about coming back to school are now having that delayed. But I also want you to know that um, I understand how badly some, children's, some children and families would like to see more in-person learning opportunities. I understand that there are parents and there are faculty who are deeply concerned and sometimes even afraid that the toll that remote learning may have on some children is just devastating. And I also know that every time I make a phone call for contact tracing, whether it's to a parent or a faculty, those responses range from a sharp intake of breath. Sometimes people burst into tears. Sometimes they are just silent. So it's terrifying because they don't know if they get sick, how sick they might get, if they'll infect somebody else. I say all of this simply to underscore the fact that none of this is easy and adhering to these values is absolutely paramount. We are not at war with one another about which way we should be going. We're trying to sort out something that is very difficult. Long story short, the metrics are not changing and I can go back to the data if school committee would like that uh, up. You can tell me what screen you'd like or need or none is fine too. Thanks, Annie, for um, pulling up that communication because I think that that um, captured, uh, you know, the the nature of the conversation. It was a great conversation that we had uh, with HEA and all of us, and I think that, um, you know, I felt like we left that conversation with a clear direction on where our focus and our energies would be would be. Um, uh, shift, not shifting towards, it's not the right word, but more focused on as we move ahead. I think we acknowledge the changing landscape. We acknowledged the um, unknowns, but we also acknowledge some of the um, positives that are coming, um, which kind of leads us into the uh, added topic around the resolution, which is, you know, the positive that is coming is this, this vaccine. We acknowledge that it's not the, you know, 
it's not the instant everything's back to normal, <laughs> but it is a, a hopeful uh, step and a tool that we discussed uh, that we will have available to us soon. Um, we also acknowledge testing as being another tool that uh, is our efforts focusing on testing, vaccination supports, and other health and safety measures uh, in order to um, really focus on those things rather than just talking about numbers. Um, which not that we've only been talking about numbers, but I'll, I think that we wanted to talk about the whole picture uh, and all of those pieces. So I appreciate you bringing up the communication and I think a lot of work uh, has been done and will continue to be done on the testing front and um, where we can, you know, put our voice right out there with the superintendents and others about our support of prioritization of vaccinations. I think we want to do that. We've committed to, you know, saying that we're committed to, to doing that and supporting that. And hopefully it'll get some traction, you know, <laughs> who knows. Um, but I think that that's, that's the, at least some outcomes that we can focus on uh, in the immediate future. Maybe if I could just chime in, Heather, and just reiterate, yeah, thank you. I thought that was a really helpful conversation we had last Thursday. I also say thanks. There was about 70 some odd families and, or individuals that joined for the listening session that we had last week on Wednesday. Um, really great conversation, a lot of heartfelt and good thinking on, on all sides. I learned several things actually, which um, my intent was really just to hear different perspectives. We talked about this document, the path to zero, but we also talked about other elements. And a lot of it was really just people sharing their um, individual experiences, which was very enlightening for me. It was, a, it was a good forum for us to hear from the teachers too. So that was a, a good precedent before the Thursday conversation with the HEA representatives. Um, I will say too, today I talked to folks at the Broad Institute, which is in Cambridge, right? They're doing some of the testing for UMass. They're doing the testing for uh, Williston. Ethan, thanks for helping me with that contact. Um, they passed me on to the CIC testing group. Uh, I'm meeting with them tomorrow to get pricing on uh, diagnostic testing. And Annie, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, the pooled testing that's being offered by the state is through CIC testing. They're, they're the contractors, if, if I get that right. Is that correct? There are actually three contractors, there aren't. Okay. Uh, but the Broad Institute is, is that's who the state is working with. Okay. Uh, so the goal would be, I think we haven't uh, any, right? We're still contemplating as a school whether we're gonna use that pool testing from the state. There's pros and cons to it. As you mentioned last week, several school districts in our uh, region have declined it. So obviously there's some cons that they, you know, they've, they've thought outweighed the benefits. Um, we're talking about that. We're also talking about, well, what would it look like if we did further diagnostic testing, say of some subset of our team, whether it's the, all the faculty, whether it's just the high school students or what have you, uh, in addition to things with pool testing or, or in place of pool testing. So I think all options are really on the table. What we're trying to do is I'm trying to gather more information. Not heard back from UMass and I've kind of hit my point where if I call them again, I'm just gonna be really annoying, which <laughs> So if anybody else has contacts there, I know they're swamped with the students back. So it's, I'm not being critical of them. They've been very kind. Uh, I've called the, you know, several other folks, uh, other places regionally, locally that do testing and, and it just haven't been able to get traction. So I'm hoping the CIC through the Broad Institute's there, our way forward of getting an option of what diagnostic testing. So, you know, that's the more refined test, the more precise test, the PCR test that, um, you know, UMass is doing bi-weekly, we could potentially do uh, weekly, something like that. Annie, anything to add on testing? Yeah. No, I don't have anything to add at this point. Uh, thank you, Paul, for all of your assistance. I know, Terry, you've also offered to help with this. And as I mentioned, Paul, my goal for tomorrow is to get what we know kind of into one document of what would each option do, why might we pursue it, and how we would move forward, meaning just having our precondition checklist for any strategy in one place. By a precondition checklist, I mean, for example, if we need certain certifications for the state, which we do before we do pool testing, what are those and where are they? So that's my priority for first thing tomorrow morning. I will say, you know, one of the insights I received from last week was, you know, while we have, I think, document path to zero saying schools should be open, you've got, um, 
you've got the CDC coming out with their guidelines last week that said schools can reopen safely. There was an article by the, the top pediatric uh, doctors at Bay State saying advocating schools should be open. Those are documents of scientists on studies. Uh, you know, the CDC is based on a study of 17 schools in rural Wisconsin um, that showed that the rates of transmission within the schools was lower than the rates of transmission within the county. That doesn't seem to resonate with everybody because I don't think that those studies can are really um, exactly mirror people's experiences and those experiences matter, right? So how do, how do I as an individual experience being a teacher or how do I as an individual experience being a parent within an area where some of my neighbors might not be following uh, this, the COVID protocols like I follow and therefore there's concern that arises, arises from that. Those are all things we heard last week. So I, while I think these data personally are compelling, I'm not in that situation where I'm a teacher. I'm not in that situation where I share some of those same concerns as some other parents. So that for me was really sort of pushing me to, to try to understand uh, everybody in their own situation. So how do we, if, are there ways to address some of those concerns? And I think testing is one. It's not gonna address every concern. It's not gonna solve all the problems, but maybe it is a way to give, um, um, to help us feel more comfortable that we can shift maybe from phase two to phase three. Uh, vaccination clearly is another one, uh, but you know, vaccinations are something that I think while the resolution is helpful, uh, when I listen to the governor every day, he's pushing as hard as he can anyway. So, you know, a resolution doesn't hurt, but, um, you know, vaccinations are somewhat out of his hands. So uh, all that to say, I'm trying to tackle each, each opportunity, each challenge as I see fit. And I think testing is sort of the, rather than focus on the metrics that we have in place and talking about how best to refine those, if at all, and I'm not saying they need revision, it, rather focus on the future. Like you said, Heather, what's, what's the next opportunity or challenge that we have. And I think testing helps address that. Thanks, Paul. And I think the thing that struck me too, both in the conversation um, that you hosted, as well as the, the papers that have come out, including Path to Zero, is that while the, the outcome may be, and we all want that same shared outcome of you know, as much, you know, in-person back to school, uh, in-person instruction as possible, it comes with the caveats of the other, it's not in isolation, right? There are other aspects of that plan that are brought out in those papers in terms of um, some of the components you identified, um, community you know, components in terms of what are some of the responsibilities of, of others outside of the schools. Um, and I, I appreciate seeing that as a whole picture because our schools are, are so much a part of the community and the bigger, uh, town. So I, I liked um, one of the things I really valued about the session that you hosted uh, was hearing from what I felt like was a very uh, representative cross section of uh, different stakeholders within our town and our schools. And I, I appreciated being able to hear that in a very open um, and respectful forum. So I thank you for providing that opportunity. Um, in the structure that you did. And I think um, we have still, you know, a number of participants on this meeting tonight that may have been in that listening session. And I thank folks for their open um, and honest sharing, especially in your sticky notes exercise that you did of um, reasons why you could support a plan and things that are the challenges. What are the things that would keep you from supporting uh, a plan? And just the way that that was structured, I do appreciate it. It helps give all of us, I think, some insight. Thanks, Heather. I agree. I think it was a wonderful conversation and I really appreciated everybody's earnest and open and uh, kind conversation. It, it was great. All right, so it sounds like um, metrics and testing. Uh, so we're not bearing the lead. We're, we're keeping the metrics that we have currently, but focusing on uh, the tools that we will have or <laughs> testing what can we get uh, and supporting uh, prioritization of, of vaccination. Really appreciated seeing some of the survey results from HEA around because um, we said, can we just take the pulse of would, would our teachers get a vaccination if it was offered? What, do our teachers plan to get it? Do our teachers, uh, would they participate in testing? 
Um, all of those things helped us, right, in these discussions around um, we're all in this together. And, and, um, and, and so I thank you for that. I, Humera, let me ask you, would you like to talk a little bit about the resolution? I would, thank you. Um, just picking up where you left off, uh, one thing about uh, testing that I wanna make sure that we are keeping in mind is that, um, you know, the, the scientists and, and, you know, all the way up as high as Fauci and global scientists have said contact tracing, testing and vaccination. These are the things, you know, and all the hand washing and masking, the mitigation strategies, um, testing, um, te testing is, um, there's lots of different kinds of testing, lots of different kinds of testing and lots of different strategies for how to execute on those tests. Um, back in the fall, we were one of the early ones that recognized that testing would be, could be game changing. If we could um, bring on board a testing strategy um, that could help really prevent us from flying blind and allow us a lot more certainty in detecting early and nipping that in the bud. And so we um, benchmarked a resolution that was um, in a handful of districts and we um, made it our own, we passed it and we be, it ended up being a resolution that a lot of um, districts adopted. And I believe there is a direct correlation between that level of overwhelming support and action that takes place at the um, state level. So I, I, I do believe in the power of these uh, resolutions. And I, like you, was very um, pleased to see the data from HEA about educators' willingness to participate in both testing and vaccination as soon as it's available. Um, in fact, I was really surprised at how much, uh, how overwhelming the level of support was. And so if we are really sort of pursuing multiple paths, then it's important for us to also look at a, uh, a resolution in support of vaccination for K-12 educators in the state. And this is a, something that another district had inquired about. Um, and so I thought that something like this already existed in the state, um, but it's still early days. And it, evidently uh, there isn't one that I found that a, um, another district has led. Um, that said, I, as you know, I work at Stanford in California. I have a lot of um, colleagues at the, um, who work with the Berkeley, Berkeley Unified School District. And I was able to find and uh, leverage a uh, resolution in support of vaccination that is appropriate for Hadley and uh, our state. I shared it with you all colleagues. Um, it is a little bit on the long side, but the essence of it is, um, Whereas we are following the mitigation strategies and doing the widespread masking and you know doing the testing and tracing or trying to adopt testing and tracing, vaccines are proven to be the most effective strategy. And therefore uh, we um, need to prioritize uh, educators um, alongside, uh, you know, after our uh, uh, frontline health workers and, um, elderly in care settings, but equally like alongside other essential and frontline workers. And so um, I do believe that such a resolution would gain traction across the state. And, you know, it's interesting because we all met in executive session on Monday. And I remember saying, we have to pass a, a, a vaccine resolution. We just, we have to pass a vaccine resolution. I remember someone saying, but the, you know, governor's already stated that it's, uh, it's phase two. Um, and I remember making the remark that, well, anything can change. I mean, this is a moving target, right? Anything can change. And sure enough, that same day, unbeknownst to us, um, the population of 65 and older um, was permitted before phase two. Now, look, I think that everyone should get vaccinated. I really do. And, and I don't think we should sit on you know, 3% of vaccines for second doses, I think we should uh, you know, get with it and start injecting and wait for another just-in-time delivery to do those second, uh, the second inoculations. So 
anything can change and anyone can go further, higher or lower down uh, the pecking order. And for that reason, I think it's absolutely essential that we pass this resolution and share it broadly across the state because I think something like this can really um, help ensure that our educators who, um, you know, who are in contact um, and what willing and ready um, can get back to school with the assuredness needed to um, operate safely. I think we owe that to our educators. So I would like to put forth that we um, we vote to, we we um, vote to approve this resolution. Yeah, I'm supportive of it. I think it it lays out you know um, the importance, the background, the ripple effects, the impact, and it describes you know, that while the current plan is that teachers um, are prioritized in group two, I believe is the correct grouping right now of phase two, um, for which group one just started today, technically, that you're saying, you know, include them uh, as top priority following healthcare workers and long-term care residents for access as soon as it's available. Um, you know, that's, <laughs> I think it's pretty clear. Yeah, this is Paul. I think that makes sense. And thanks for putting that together here, Mara. I just wanted to, everybody okay with all that language? There's some strong language in there. Um, on, I think it's second page. Um, so you just wanted to make sure everybody in the school committee is comfortable. It's, you know, the full extent of the ripple effects are unknown, but undoubtedly significant and tragic. Do we want to say it that strongly? Inability to safely open schools has threatened the long-term educational outcomes for many students mental and physical health of many students. I just, maybe there's some different language that gets to that same message. Other than that, I really appreciate that. I, I agree with the intent, totally. Is this something, just thinking, Annie, about protocol, can we, can we send in any requests for revisions to Humera on an individual basis if we need, because I mean, full disclosure, I think we all just saw this starting today. Um, there's language from your superintendent's letter that maybe that might help if that wasn't pulled in already, Humera, we could pull in. Um, but then would we, we would need to be in an open meeting to vote to approve it, to send it out. Is that correct? So if you, here's what you could do. So you're correct that if individual people uh, provide feedback to Humera, as long as you don't do that collectively, electronically, or via Zoom, you provide Humera with individual feedback. You could say that um, uh, you kind of, Humera would integrate that feedback into a revised resolution um, and, um, and proceed that way, or, and I would check with school committee council to make sure that you could, and if school committee council said you couldn't, then we bring it back on the 22nd. Um, I mean, every uh, day, every week is just, um, it's gonna affect the strategy that is employed. So um, if we want to apply delays because of language, we can. Um, if there's a specific word um, that you would feel um, if stricken would be just as um, uh, appropriate. Uh, I'm all ears, um, but I do feel as though um, this is, you know, it's, it's just gonna, if we bring this back at the end of February, sure. I mean, by then perhaps <laughs> other, groupings will um, be elevated or get higher in the priority. And certainly you won't have the um, other school districts around the state um, taking action um, in coordination. But I'm, I'm open to uh, adjusting language right now. If we feel that something is Truly. Paul, did you have any suggestions? Yeah, truly. I, I could live with that. I, to be honest, I was, 
how do I say this diplomatically? I've been an advocate to, I think we can safely open the schools and not everybody agrees with that position. I just don't want to say that those people who don't agree with that position are causing a significant and tragic occurrence, right? And so that's what I worry about setting up. But if you all are comfortable with it, that's fine. Um, we just say, there's a risk of those words getting turned back upon us. That's my caution. But So I can strike that part out. Um, the full extent of the ripple effects of an inability to safely open schools are unknown. Period. Or, or potentially just change undoubtedly to potentially. Or poten yeah, and, but, but potentially significant. And we could remove and tragic. Do we want to remove and tragic as such? Are we good to go with this? I think uh, I understand Paul's position on this and I, I agree. I think um, yeah. trying to remove some of the emotion aspect of this and more talk about um, the facts, right? You've, the, we've laid out a lot of the facts around um, the background on this, uh, you know, how to, you know, widespread mask wearing, all contact tracing, vaccines are effective, steps. Um, but then we turn it to, okay, we don't, I don't think we necessarily need to say tragic. Yeah, and, and it, it's now removed. Personally, I think you could end that paragraph after suffer as well. I don't think, I think as Heather said, the rest of it is, could be seen as uh, judgmental and finger pointing and um, you know what we heard in the listening session are other perspectives that um, I feel criticized by that. Yes, uh, okay, so uh, when our schools cannot open, children suffer maybe uh, ex too extreme. So, um, Um, there are consequences. Yeah. So we could, I could strike this, which is highlighted. Everything from when to well. As such. I'm okay with that. Okay. Do we want to stay with threatened? <laughs> You could you could make it less um, intentional and say could threaten. We we don't know or remove it or or challenged. Could yeah. Could compromise or could challenge. Yeah, that looks better. I like that compromise. Yeah. Okay. Most vulnerable mental physical health <clears throat> lives and livelihood. Those those are all facts, right? Those are all yeah. outcomes that we've talked about. Full extent um, are unknown, but potentially significant. That's true. Great. Thank Better. you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I agree, Paul. Thank you for pointing that out. Thank I think you, it's just that paragraph that seemed to, like you said, a little bit. The language is, could potentially be inflammatory, but the rest of this is, was great. Thanks, Humera, for bringing it forward. You're welcome. Okay, so um, should I make a, uh, Ethan, did you have a comment? No, nope. go ahead. Uh, should I make a motion to approve this or is there? Yeah, seconded. Okay. All in favor. Aye. 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 Yeah, I'll get it um, signed. And uh, I'll work with Annie and folks to get it distributed. Thank you very much. And I will share it with um, other districts in case they would like to consider something like this. I think the faster we all move in concert, the, um, the more, um, more likely it is that we will prioritize educators. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Okay, draft calendar. We ready to talk about next year? I am, and I'm not going to screen share because I don't want to confuse people. This is the draft no vote calendar. Just a few heads up, a few heads up because we are still working out the details. 
we will probably look to have staff return on August 27th. That is a Friday. Uh, contractually, teachers and other unit A members, uh, specialists, their school year doesn't start uh, before August 26th, or we've understood that to be, it's August 26th would be the, August 27th would be the early date that they would return. So August 27th, educators potentially at this point would return and that would put students back in probably Tuesday, August 31st. And right now what we're looking at is if we count out then the 180 days for student learning that's required include the required professional development days, we would probably have all students ending June 17th, Friday, that assumes absolutely no snow, five snow days brings it out to the following Friday, and uh, graduation back to the first Friday in June, is typically which is uh, the third in 2022. It used to always be the first Friday in June, if you folks remember, it wasn't until recently, just these last two years, it's been the Friday of Memorial Day weekend, and that has had to do with um, just how the calendar has fallen and when seniors are allowed to end their school year. That's stipulated in the law. There's, um, it can't be, uh, it can't be any earlier than 12 days, uh, earlier than the scheduled end date for the remaining students. Some things we're looking at are, is there a way to allow for additional meaningful professional development and planning time within the calendar and provide uh, interesting, what we would call deep learning opportunities for students. So we're talking about, are there ways to maybe bring uh, different organizations into the schools that might uh, provide students with instruction in uh, the performing arts or um, we could have speakers. We could also look at some of some community organizations and see if they might be interested in coming in and providing opportunities for students. So this is still a work in progress and we'll have more information on the 22nd. But I do know that some families are do wonder. And of course, all of this assumes that um, we're making steady progress with COVID-19 in terms of vaccinations. We're well on the path to this kind of kicking off a, a normal school year, I certainly hope and anticipate that that would be the case. Um, and so if families are wondering now, gosh, what should I be thinking? Um, be thinking uh, around Tuesday, August 31st as a return date, somewhere in that neighborhood for students. And again, uh, staff no earlier than the 27th of August. And to be continued. Yeah, Annie, my only feedback on this is mm -hmm. in some of the past discussions around graduation, mm -hmm. it was to, you know, try to get seniors um, completed within the month of May uh, for other commitments that they may have, jobs, whatever the next step, you know, beyond high school is. And so, I mean, I'm not seeing where that's entirely possible here unless you're starting earlier. But I also, I'm assuming that you're applying the same, the, the, traditional number of days that we need right. to have in person. Yeah, that's the trick, Heather, is that, um, so there's there's 180 days that are required. Those are the time on learning requirements for all students. And there's a specific law that indicates the earliest that 12th grade students can have their last day. And it has to fall within so many days from the scheduled last day for other students. Otherwise it's actually a violation of the law. It's part of the reason I wanted to bring this up. I don't want families having it planted in their head. Oh, it's Memorial Day weekend, it's graduation. It is highly unlikely. I will say now impossible that that's gonna happen next year. When you look at time on learning and contracts, right? So contracts stipulate uh, staff return dates and they're all reasonable. You know, there are reasons for them. Nobody is creating problems or getting in the way. These are laws and contracts that, that exist for a reason. Okay. And then my only other question was, um, have, I mean, I'm assuming that there hasn't been any talk yet of, among either the superintendents groups or from the state around having that extra time at the beginning of the year 
like was afforded this year in terms of um, personnel planning time? I can't imagine that that would happen, but again, anything can happen. The commissioner, actually the board of education had to, had to kind of, what's the word I want, suspend the time on learning requirements for this year. So students only, those additional 10 days for teachers meant that students had 170 days of instruction and that suspension of, it wasn't, the law wasn't amended. Um, the expectation was suspended. And so I, um, I don't foresee that happening, but I think humorous, right? In this world, everything changes all the time. So I guess my answer would maybe worth nothing in a month but I don't foresee that happening. It's not worth nothing. <laughs> we'll just revisit it if we need to. And that's Any it for questions? the calendar, yeah. All right, we, this isn't an action item for us, just a FYI. Okay. Hey, Annie, just, just to interrupt real quick. Is there any um, thought or talk of summer school this summer? So certainly there is um, right now at uh, Hopkins Academy, there have been efforts to organize opportunities for supplemental instruction over various breaks. I know that for students that some of those options that have already been provided um, were not met with huge enthusiasm. And I can say that I understand that the idea of going to school over break doesn't sound all that thrilling. We are actively working on um, what supports will be available in the summer. And yes, so we always have additional what's called extended school year for those students who qualify under special education. But in addition to that, we have funding that will allow us to provide academic tutoring and support and other things for all students, uh, if that is something that they need. Thanks. Okay, great, thank you. Um, next is the formative evaluation of superintendent. Uh, yes, so I don't think I need to screen share on that either. That was just my report to all of you. And again, I'll reiterate the laws changed slightly in the past at my formative evaluation, you've actually had to kind of vote and come to consensus on uh, what ranking, like progress uh, ranking that you would like to assign to me. All that's required at this point is, um, this is an opportunity for you to give me feedback. If there are any glaring deficiencies with my performance that you would like corrected before year's end, uh, it's important that those are stated uh, now, or if you say that you need an additional meeting to address that, we can do that as well. Um, so really it's just an opportunity for any feedback regarding adjustments that you'd like to see, the goals that I and the district are currently working on, like to see our attention shift elsewhere. That would be helpful to know uh, if there's any performance deficiencies you'd like addressed. That's all you need to do at this point. And the uh, summative comes at the end of the year. And if there's nothing, that's okay too. I just, um, upon recently looking at the strategy documents, I um, was surprised that we were present enough in light of how volatile and changing our uh, monthly environment is, that we had the presence in, of mind to add some critical new things and shift our priorities. And I, I think you've done an, a great job of helping manage that orientation towards uh, a COVID environment and um, managing new schedules and mitigation strategies. And uh, I think you're doing a pretty remarkable job. I don't know what we would do if we did not have you in place in this role. And I feel very lucky. Um, so no, no changes on my part. Yeah, I would agree. I think you've been, you know, very responsive where we've brought um, new things to your attention or new initiatives. I think you've brought things to us. Um, when you look at the successful, you know, grants and opportunities that you have pursued uh, with, with 
the support of your staff or, or have, you know, tap them as being the lead in pursuing those things. I think they follow your model that you laid out for them. And um, that's it, been very successful. I think that um, continuing to be open with, with us and helping to um, be sure that we are grounded in what is, um, I guess, really the current feelings of uh, the staff, of the administration, of um, just the, the, the lay of the land. You know, I, I appreciate that because, you know, in this environment, I mean, we're not stopping by. We're not, you know, none of us, I don't think, are really walking the halls and saying hello and seeing, you know, everybody there. And so this is really an opportunity for us to connect with um, teachers, administration, you. So much appreciated that you're willing to be open with us about here's what's, you know, here's what's going on. Here's what we, you know, what you would recommend. And I also appreciate you listening when we surface ideas or offers or opportunities that it's, it, it you take it in good faith and you don't take it as, you know, any kind of, you know, indication that you you all aren't doing enough because that's not at all where it's coming from. It's really coming from, we all want to help. We all want to support. Um, and so we're willing to do what we need to do to, to help make that happen. So I, I appreciate the, um, you know, the spirit in which you receive those kinds of uh, um, suggestions or, or um, comments. So thank you. Well, thank you all. Thank you very much. There's nothing that needs to change. That's great. I will say, yeah, I agree. I think you, Mary, said it. We're very lucky to have you. So I would have expected you to figure out this COVID thing by now. So I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> there's, there's always tomorrow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Annie. Thanks a lot. And uh, so I think that is the end of presentation and discussion. I don't have the agenda right in front of me. It oh is. Oh, yeah. Great. And we discussed the resolution already. So um, we'll move into school committee reports and discussion. And then um, right after that, we'll have announcements. I see um, Jane Nevin Smith had her hand up. So we will make sure she gets an announcement up there. She's got one. Uh, so for school committee reports and discussion, uh, collaborative, Humera, I believe you attended a meeting for them. I did. I attended, I think it was a three hour board meeting last Wednesday and um, lots going on at the collaborative. Um, they are putting together programs that our districts need right now. And I, I'm sure Annie and the other educators see that through their weekly um, uh, mailings. I will forward to all of my colleagues on this call um, the uh, latest executive director's report, which is, has a lot of information. But one thing I wanted to point out, um, I wanted to make sure I reached out, I asked, in the context of the board meeting about the spiffy um, report. So um, many of you know, CES um, works with a team that executes on our student health uh, information. I think their query of students um, in our population is uh, once every two years. Um, but it goes back for many, many years and it provides a really sound baseline for um, what kinds of numbers are normal uh, year after year for different things um, from um, smoking and tobacco uses and e-cigarettes to drinking at the various age levels to um, depression and anxiety and suicidal thoughts. And I thought, especially in light of the mental health issues that are being surfaced amongst our uh, student population um, nationally and um, uh, also locally, uh, it would be really good to have that external entity conduct that review. And they were in real time able to call the people who do the analysis to, to say, yes, in fact, we are definitely doing it and we will be reaching out into schools in earnest this coming month. Um, so 
I'm not sure if they were planning on doing it or not. Maybe they were like, oh, it's COVID where there's no way we're going to get a hold of. But the fact that we say something, I think it always goes towards influencing um, what we need to happen. So I was just really, really pleased to hear that. Um, so Annie, if you haven't already been contacted or the building principals, and um, we uh, should definitely get on that as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. We have been, uh, Ms. Camuso and Nurse Master Toro, because the, these data about risk assessment, we every two years, they survey eighth, 10th and 12th graders. So they have already started setting that up at Hopkins Academy. So thank you. Wonderful. for that. Great, thank you, Humara. Anything yeah. else from the collaborative? Oh, sorry, Paul, go ahead. I was just, the timing on that. Um, when does that that happen? Annie, that, is that soon? Yes, it will happen, pro oh, gosh, I wish I had the email in front of me, but it will happen soon. I wanna say, perhaps I'll survey them in March. We'll get it all organized in March, okay. maybe sooner. Thanks for sitting in a three hour meeting, Humara. Jeez, just what you wanted, I'm sure. My only regret was that I couldn't come to yours, Paul, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it, okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. Too many meetings. Indeed. Uh, so negotiations, uh, I guess our update on that would be that we um, did meet last week. Uh, I think it was last week, <laughs> yes, and came, uh, went into executive session and came back into open session to agree to uh, the negotiations that we conducted with Unit A, which is the um, Hadley Educators Association uh, teachers. Uh, so there are different units that we have for different um, personnel and roles. Uh, and so Unit A, we did uh, agree um, in that uh, open meeting vote to um, the terms that we had agreed to with them. And so I believe that it goes to their uh, representation right for uh, any approval process so that's where we stand and we look forward to meeting with unit d i believe which that's, is the, we the have process. we but we need to go into executive session before we can make any announcements about unit d got so it we'll go into executive tonight and, and uh, return to open afterwards all right so we look forward to talking about that and then come back coming back out and unit d uh would somebody like to speak to just unit d who that population is I'm unmuted, I can, I'm happy to. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Paul and uh, Ethan for participating in negotiations. Unit D represents the educational support professionals for the ESPs in the district. So we have negotiated and uh, we look forward to speaking with the school committee in executive session tonight and the school committee can then vote out and open afterwards. Great, thank you. And finance, um, any update on finance, tri-board, any of that, our budget update, Annie? I do have a budget update. Sorry, Ethan, I don't mean to steal your thunder here. I just wanna take the school committee through a couple things very quickly. Last Monday, I uh, presented to you a budget overview, indicated that the entire bottom line was decreasing in FY22 by about $21,000. But to get to level service that we would need about 53,000 or 53,600, we'll call it $54,000, which represents an increase of less than 1% to the request uh, to the town for local contribution. I met with the town administrator, I met with the town treasurer, everybody on the town side is doing a great job. It was a wonderful meeting. Um, and I will say, I'd like to bring another recommendation forward to the school committee. Um, and that is, oh bother. Uh, hmm. I thought I don't get to share a window. I'm trying to share something else and it's not happening. So I'm just going to explain it to you. I had beautiful graphs to show you, but I'll give up on that. What I'm recommending is that we uh, simply have requested the town to fund a local contribution uh, at FY21 levels. And the reason that I'm requesting that or suggesting that is because the town, so if we were to do that, it doesn't mean that we would make any uh, cuts to the proposed budget that we have for FY22. We are receiving uh, some money. We know of right now, some money that we're getting, some additional COVID money, about uh, 
$21,000 of additional COVID money. But also the reason that I'm recommending this is that the town requested level funding from departments because uh, one of the largest revenue streams in the town, which is meals and occupancy tax, is um, those revenues are going to be probably quite low in fiscal year 21, this fiscal year. The last time we had a fully normal year in the town was fiscal year 19, right? Because in fiscal year 20, businesses were forced to close their, their doors and significantly reduce their services in the spring, last spring, which was fiscal year 20. So in fiscal year 19, the town collected about $841,000 in rooms tax, occupancy tax, and about $383,000 in meals tax. And right now in FY21, we're about halfway through the year, they've collected about $216,000 in rooms tax and about $149,000 in meals tax. So you can see that um, we're halfway through the year and yet those revenue streams are much less than they've collect they haven't collected half of the revenue stream from fiscal year 19. Um, and uh, I've pointed out to you before, and I'll make sure that I have visuals uh, for you the next time we get a budget update, but the town is extremely generous with the schools. The town funds the schools well above required local contribution, significantly above required local contribution. Um, now, the schools as a percentage of total operating budget in the town in fiscal year 20, I want to say, is the most recent data we have for that. Um, the school department is about 40% of the town's budget. In surrounding communities, that usually runs closer to, sometimes it's around 40%. Northampton's around 40, 41%. Amherst is closer to 53%. Belcher Town, in some, of the, in some other communities in Hampshire County, the school department is a much larger percentage of the total operating budget. So we are certainly a reasonable percentage of the total operating budget, but that we should not, um, it, it, it's I think important to underscore how supportive the town is. And again, I'll make sure that it's easy for me to show some of these visuals the next time we talk about the budget, because when you see um, the support that the town gives, um, it's a powerful image. So having said all that, I would like to make a different recommendation and that is simply that the school department will request level funding from local contribution in the town. Uh, we are in a position to still make the budget. All those priorities I laid out for you last week, we can make that work. We can make it work with this additional uh, COVID funding and by using additional school choice funds. So we can definitely make it work. And by doing that, it's my hope that other departments like public safety, um, that other departments who, if we don't do this, there's no chance they can get to level service. I'm hoping that they can get to level service. If the school committee has any reservations about that, it'd be important for me to know that. Um, if you're on board with that, I will certainly, we'll change here tonight and I will make sure the town administrator knows that uh, later this evening when the meeting is over. Yeah, I'm on board with that. I think um, it was, you know, an amount that we, it seems like we have resources to be able to cover that amount. Um, you, you did due diligence up front of doing what was asked in terms of level service uh, and looking at level funding, what we'd have to do to make up the difference. Uh, and so, it, I mean, based on also hearing about the support that we would be getting from uh, uh, COVID relief, you know, state state support, federal support for this year, I, which we clearly are looking for initiatives around testing to be able to uh, use those funds. It seems like this is a small part of something that we can do to, again, help the town. I agree. And that's it for, that's all I have for the budget and finance at this point. All right. Uh, we do have one action item, approval of minutes, um, and then we'll do any announcements or updates. So we do have one set of minutes, the January 4th 
uh, 21 minutes. I have a minor modification and that is the spelling of my last name under the approval of last, the last set of minutes, minor thing. Uh, but uh, barring that, I motion to approve these minutes. No, it's an important Second. thing. <laughs> All in favor. Aye. 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 All right. Um, so we would like to just have a place Holder for any announcements or updates. Um, I have one, and if there's anybody, uh, town officials on the call that would like to um, also provide any kind of announcement or update, please raise your hand. I know um, often Jane Nevin Smith joins us or uh, representatives from the Board of Health. So wanna give them an opportunity to make any town announcements. Um, and there is Jane Nevin Smith there. So I will actually let her take the floor, ask her to unmute. Jane, you should be able to talk now. I'm unmuted, thank you. I'm requesting that you all pay attention to seniors over 75 who are not computer literate. The only way they can sign up for a COVID shot is online. Mm -hmm. So if you have a neighbor or a family member or know of somebody, please try to get them help signing up. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And I also, I appreciate, I think some postcards were sent out recently um, from the Council on Aging. And Governor Baker, I know also announced that um, he acknowledged that, uh, that barrier in terms of um, relying on online. And I understand he announced that there would be a hotline that would be starting up or it was something that seniors could call. Um, and so it, I, I would look for more information on that, um, but it is, again, another example of things change every day, right? So if enough folks talk about the challenges with a particular group and access, um, that things may be able to change. But appreciate, Jane, your comments and would encourage uh, anyone to, yes, definitely help, help a neighbor, um, help uh, you know, your friends and your family in this. Yeah, and as things changed last week, they told us there was no more vaccine. And today they announced there were 2,400 new doses starting today. So it changes. Yep, it's what was in the fridge. <laughs> that's, that's Amherst, Northampton and Hadley. So. Thank you, Jane, appreciate that. Um, I had one announcement and it's more of a kudos and I see that we're gonna talk about it at the end of February, I was hoping to. Uh, I would just like to thank, uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to say one name just because I know that she personally has shown up at my door. Actually, I'll say two because they both have shown up at my door with gifts for my senior uh, in my family, my son, who uh, feels very appreciated as uh, I see two other folks on this committee who could speak to this. But uh, I'll just thank Christine Markowski and Allison Willette. And I know there are others uh, and I want to hear about others who have supported um, recognizing our seniors. And just to give you an example, um, they showed up on the first day, the Sunday before the first day of school uh, with balloons and a, a nice printed certificate. We've got some pictures of that that I think we've shared um, either on the Hopkins Academy page or, or elsewhere. They showed up this weekend with a hand painted Hopkins Academy mug um, with a hawk, a golden hawk on it and um, hot chocolate and a beautiful poem with a countdown, uh, kind of a, you know, new year uh, countdown to graduation. And, you know, my son misses the senior class opportunities that all of us, you know, many of us had as high schoolers um, that all of that we would want for our kids. And, the it's those little things that actually are really big things that I, I really appreciate and I know that he does as well. So um, I wanna thank them and I'd like to, you know, have more of a formal opportunity to, to really talk about some of those things, celebrate those things as well as the sixth grade, you know, moving into this uh, seventh grade and some of the folks who have been part of those initiatives. So thank you. I have a quick announcement, Heather. Uh, if there are none others, no other announcements. Um, so uh, just a quick reminder that February 4th, this Thursday, there's another Hadley Learns um, video podcast. Um, you know, it's, uh, it sounds odd to say book reading when there's no book, but um, 
but uh, if you go to hadleylearns.com, uh, the topic of the month is uh, ways to address inequity in the K-12 education system. And there's some great thinkers on this topic uh, whose videos we have shared. Um, so we welcome that you sign up. All you need to do is watch one of those videos and then compare, come prepared to have a, a small group discussion with other folks about um, what some of the issues um, are that were, um, that, that were uh, discussed in those videos and what kinds of things might be right to explore in Hadley. So um, we urge uh, everyone to attend. It's such a um, wonderfully welcoming group um, and it's a great place to meet people and, and discuss these issues. So check that Thanks, out. Mayor. Thanks, Mayor. Just picking up on what you said, Heather, too, just I know Mary Tudrin and Christine Pipchinski have been involved, too. I'm sure there's multiple others, but um, I, I also want to say I know April Camuso, Principal Camuso, sent out an email talking about starting a plan for senior graduation. So I, I, I know there's some thinking out there. Um, I think we had some lessons, too, from this last year, like the parade I thought was was really well done this year. It'd be great to see that replicated. Hopefully, Hopefully we can have some sort of close proximity, maybe I'm being too hopeful, but um, yeah. So I know there's already thinking out there and it, 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 I think April was looking for ideas that, so if others have ideas about how to make senior graduation, senior week successful, I think she, she'd asked for feedback. Thanks Paul. And thanks for mentioning Mary and Ms. Pep around that. I really appreciate all of their efforts. All right. Any other announcements or updates for tonight? Shout outs. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're next meeting dates. We have lots of opportunities. February 8th, we have a special meeting for data review. 15th, we won't meet. Um, and then the 22nd, we'll have our full meeting with business manager reports, Hopkins program of studies and celebrating our 12th and our sixth graders. So we do need a motion to adjourn our regular meeting and move to go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining uh, and to reconvene, not to no, not. Yes, to no, we do need to reconvene. Yeah. We need to, to reconvene not. an open session. Yes. Is there a motion for what I just said? Oh. <laughs> Second. Second. Uh, do we need a roll call vote? Yes. Okay. Uh, Paul. Yep. Humera. Hi. Ethan. Yes. Tara. Tara stepped away, I think, for a second. Tara. Okay. I'll use this Heather. moment to say Corey Feltovic's also involved in the senior thing, so I don't, I don't make sure I don't miss anybody. Thank you, Corey. Thanks, Corey. Keep them coming. Keep them healthy. <laughs> All right. Uh, and Clash, I, so let's, oh, Tara got booted. She's coming back in. She's in there. Uh, she's in the waiting room. All right. We are now adjourning our regular meeting and moving to go into executive session. We will come back in, um, back into open session to vote. Thank you, everyone who has left. I just assumed Tara was like, it's ha I'm happy I don't have to be back on that. <laughs> I thought she had cats. It's a little bit. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, Tara. Uh, cats Tara. were going crazy the whole time. And so now the law then requires that the school committee, uh, you just voted in an executive session to uh, agree to the contract terms that unit D presented of uh, a one year contract with a 1.5% COLA increase um, that is subject to ATA ratification. Uh, you would need to move that and second it in open session and do a roll call vote. For it. I moved. Second. Okay, roll call vote. Paul? Yes. Ethan? Yes. Tara? Aye, uh, yes. Humera? Aye. Heather, aye. All right. It is approved. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Need a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. Great work, guys. So moved. Seconded. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Good night, guys. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night, guys. Yeah. Great work. Thank you.